hope everyone's doing well. Today we're going to be talking about Nevada by Imogen Binney. Um, I really, really like this book. I read it in like one day the first time I read it. I read it in two days this time. Um, and I, I hope you guys enjoyed it too. Like I think it's a good, <coughs> um, somewhat escapist book for, you know, what's going on now. Um, it's nice to have a novel you can just kind of like fall into so I hope that I hope that you guys you know have that experience somewhat um but you know if not that's okay too <laughs> um so I'm definitely gonna have to lecture more than just once on this book um but uh yeah so today we're just gonna kind of I'm gonna give you guys some context and we're gonna talk about sort of the first the first little bit of it talk about some of the themes um that I think are important in this book um so, the reason I wanted to read Jack Kerouac, uh, the excerpts from On the Road, before we read this book, is because this book is a road novel, and it's definitely like in conversation with the famous road novels that came before it, um, most specifically On the Road, which is even alluded to at one point in this book, um, and also I think <coughs> um, Hunter S. Thompson's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and possibly The Motorcycle Diaries. I've never read that book, but um, there's a lot of bike stuff in here and that's a famous road novel, so it probably, probably influenced this book as well. So a road novel is basically a book about hitting the road. Um, it is a uniquely American form of novel um, that was pioneered by Jack Kerouac in 1950, the 50s, I'm not sure if it was 1950 or a little later. Um, in his book, On the Road. Um, and there's a Kerouac presentation that you can look at, but I'm not, not sure if I have the presentations from both classes yet, but those should be up by the end of the week. Um, so, so the road novel uh, takes place usually in a car, usually traveling across America by highway. Um, and the whole like highway system of America is unique to our country. Like most countries don't have these kind of sprawling highways that people use to go from one end of the country to the other. Um, think about Europe, you know, you, you take a train, you take a, you take a cheap flight. Like America is um, more than any other country sort of symbolized by this idea of the road. Like the open road is like the American ideal of freedom, right? You hit the road, you go west, um, you find yourself. So these are some of the themes that road novels deal with. Um, they're always going to have to do with the search for yourself, the search for a sense of belonging, and I think also a search for a sort of kind, like some kind of authenticity. Um, and all of those are happening in Nevada. Um, so usually in your, in your classic road novel, a young man seeks adventure by driving across the country. Um, throughout the book, this young man, who is our protagonist, often will seek a thrill any way he can get it. So if you've ever read or seen the movie, I don't think I've seen this movie, but I'm pretty sure it's the same as the book. Um, if you ever like read or seen Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, like that whole story just takes place in like like during like a drug fueled haze like he is just binging on like hallucinogens the whole time um while writing about this road trip that he went on um however part of i guess the um part of what underpins the road novel as a classic genre is the celebration of um, freedom, and in celebrating that freedom, it's generally going to be celebrating the freedom of white cis straight men to go wherever they want and to do whatever they want in America. Um, and so I think we need to ask ourselves if this is the kind of freedom celebrated in a road novel, are they actually that transgressive, right? Like, are they that... Um, are they really challenging the American canon by talking about drugs and sex and rock and roll? Or 
are they just kind of a new way of, um, or, you know, new at the time in the 60s and 50s, were they just sort of a new way of celebrating, like, the, you know, white male individuality of, like, quintessential America? Um, so there's obviously nothing wrong with the road novel. It's just, it's usually about straight men. Um, and so that's what, to me, makes this book interesting and contemporary and, like, modern, right? Like, it's not, it's not just doing that over and over again. It's not repeating the same pattern of, like, straight white dude goes, does a bunch of drugs, goes west, has an adventure, finds himself, the end, right? It's a lot more complicated than that. Um, and so I think that's a really important thing we have to think about in this book. So, like, one of the themes is just this idea of taking up space and, like, who gets to take up space and who doesn't. So, I'm a woman, and uh, many of you watching this are also women. Um, so think about when you travel, or if you are to go on a road trip, would you do that alone? And if not, why? And what would you be scared of? So I think, like, depending on your identity, and specifically if you're not just, like, a cis dude, um, we have to worry more or less about like what might happen to us out there, right? Like I, I know a lot of men who will walk home alone at night, which, you know, it's a little dangerous. They probably shouldn't do it, but I do not know any women who will do that. Um, and so that's just sort of like one basic example of like the way in which the world is safer um, depending on your identity, right? So for Maria, um, she is constantly incredibly self-conscious about being trans. And I think this book asks us to think about the way that society treats trans women and how that affects, like, the individual psyche of trans women. Because Maria can never stop thinking about, like, you know, can they tell I'm trans? Is it okay to be trans in this space? Um, are they going to mess with me because I'm trans? And for the most part, like, that doesn't even happen to her in this book, but it has happened to her, right? And, like, she knows people it's happened to, and she knows it could happen at any time. Um, like, being a trans woman in the world is still, it's difficult. Like, it's a dangerous position to hold, especially if you don't pass as cis, like, if you don't look um, like a cis woman. So cis, cisgender just means that you identify with the gender that you were assigned at birth, so like, I am a cis woman. Um, transgender means that you do not identify with the gender you were assigned at birth, so maybe you were like assigned female at birth, everybody said you were a girl, and you actually feel like you're a man, or you feel like you don't identify <clears throat> with either of those ends of the gender binary. Um, you feel like you're somewhere in the middle, right? Like you're not a man, you're not a woman. So either of those identities would be trans. Um, and I guess maybe we should start by defining some of the terms in this book, because I think it definitely uses a lot of, like, sort of gender studies terms pretty, uh, like, I guess casually in a way that can be somewhat difficult to follow if you're not familiar with that. So one thing that she talks about a lot in this book is cis-normativity and heteronormativity. So normativity is just when we decide that something is normal. Heteronormativity is when we treat heterosexuality like that is the normal way that everything is. So if I meet a woman and she's talking about like her spouse and I say something like, what's your husband's name? That would be heteronormative because although she didn't tell me the gender of the person she's married to, I assumed she was straight and asked her husband's name instead of asking her like, you know, her partner's name or something like that, like a gender neutral term. Um, this normativity is when we assume that um, being cisgendered is the norm. Um, so something like the idea that like all women have periods or something, um, that would be cis-normative. Um, and those are important for lots of other reasons too, right? Like the reason that you very rarely see trans people on TV um, and you don't see a lot of trans directors winning Oscars and stuff is because we live in a cis-normative culture that makes it 
difficult um, for trans people to sell their stories to the public because of various power structures, etc. Um, that's also like perhaps why this book is published with an independent press, right? Like there are, I don't, I don't think there are any trans authors in our Norton anthology, but there, there might be a couple, um, but very, very, very few. Um, whereas this, this press, Topside Press, publishes only trans authors, so it's like a space for trans stories um, to be told. She also talks a lot about like the patriarchy, patriarchal society that she lives in, um, and I'm pretty sure we've talked about this in class and most people kind of know what the patriarchy is, but on a basic level, the patriarchy, or a patriarchy, is a system of society in which men hold the power and women are largely excluded from it. Um, so we definitely live in a patriarchal society. You can look at the gender makeup of Congress for that. You can look at like, we've never had a female president. Um, you can even look culturally like, you know, if you look at all your syllabi, are there more men or are there more women, right? Uh, if you look at your anthology, look how many men are in there, right? Um, and the patriarchy doesn't just mean that women are excluded from power, but it also, by extension, often means that, like, queer people are excluded from power, um, trans people are excluded from power, um, and our, our patriarchy in particular uh, was built on a system of slavery and white supremacy, so we also live in a country where the patriarchy excludes non-white people from power most of the time. Um, and all of these things are changing, right? And they're, you know, maybe partly changing because we can like read books like Nevada and like there's more, there's more stories being told now than there were. Um, even like, you know, in the early 2000s or the 90s. Um, and this book came out in 2013. And I think since this book came out, like things have, um, in a lot of ways changed, like in terms of how we, uh, <clears throat> I guess, like, talk about being trans in our culture, stuff like that. Um, okay. So, I hope that made sense. Um, I, it, it really is hard to lecture about this stuff when you're just, you know, talking to a, to a camera, <laughs> to my phone, really. Um, but yeah, if you, if you have any questions at all, you're obviously always welcome to email me or I guess you could like comment on my YouTube videos too. I'll answer those. Um, okay. <clears throat> so what Imogen Binney is doing with this book is she is subverting the old American form of the road novel by telling the story about someone who isn't a cis white guy and to subvert something is to undermine the power and authority of an established system. So the established genre of the road novel, always about like straight white dudes. So she subverts it by writing a book that's not about that. This isn't the first road novel that was about like not a straight white dude. It's just, there hasn't been like a, you know, there hasn't been an on the road or whatever that's been as famous um, that wasn't about a straight white dude. So throughout the story, um, Maria is searching for her purpose. She believes she finds it when she meets James. Um, but even that is more of an, <clears throat> an illusion than the truth. So when they first meet, she thinks that kid is trans and he doesn't even know it yet. And then she decides that she's going to take him to Reno and teach him about like trans stuff, basically, as she puts it. Um, however, instead of like guiding him towards some grand epiphany, she gets too high and falls asleep on his couch, um, and then they have sort of a weird conversation in the car, and then they go to Reno, and then he gets his girlfriend to pick him up. So it's kind of an anticlimactic ending, um, which we'll talk more about next time. But um, I think it is important to um, remember that because the road novel is sort of about like finding yourself, um, we expect there to be an ending that gives us an epiphany. Um, and an epiphany is uh, when a character is suddenly struck with a life-changing realization which changes the rest of the story. 
we think in the beginning that Maria might be having an epiphany, right? Um, so she tells us all this stuff, right? Like that she she's looking for her honest self. She wants to like take Steph's car, all this stuff. Um, and it kind of feels like at least to me, it kind of feels like Maria's figuring something out about herself, right? Like she's figuring out that she has never been able to experience her emotions fully. Um, and she's repressed because she was raised um, as a boy and taught to repress her emotions in the way that our society does to all young boys, right? Like most young boys, especially like she was what, 29 in 2013, so she would have been like seven years older than me so she would have been born in like the 80s right like the early 80s so for boys who were like growing up in the 80s um your parents really would have taught you like men don't cry men don't have strong emotions you know men like make a lot of money and like lift weights or whatever I don't know the 80s was like a pretty like um macho time for American culture so she would have grown up being taught to repress her emotions just because that's what young boys were supposed to do. But she also would have grown up being taught to repress her emotions because she knew, and as she says, she always felt like there was like something weird about her. Um, she didn't know what it was, but she knew that she couldn't talk about it. Like she didn't live in a, um, a family situation or society where she could talk about that. Um, and we don't really know about Maria's family, right? Like, we know that she hated where she grew up, and we know that she bounced, but that's, that's really all we get. Um, so it seems like she's having this epiphany about her own repression and the way in which she needs to be single in order to find herself, but every moment of possible epiphany, I think, in this book is kind of undercut. So, um, <clears throat> I'm trying to find the part where, like, Steph is talking it's like right before part two sorry I always do this where I just like dog ear too many pages and I can't find anything anymore. Um, but basically, something I really like about this book um, is that every time our narrator kind of thinks like, um, or I guess like every time someone is thinking something about themselves or someone else, it's like then we get the perspective of the person they're thinking about. So, like, Maria's making all these assumptions about Steph throughout the first part of the book, right? And I think normally, um, when we have this kind of narrator, we never get the perspective of the other person in the relationship. But in this book, we do get a chapter about Steph. And within that chapter, Steph is like, yeah, Maria's going to, you know, she's going to take my car. Oh, here it is. Okay, sorry. Page 117, it starts. Um, so, uh, on page 121 is what I want to talk about. So this is what felt like our epiphany with Maria, that Steph has been like, this, you know, she does this all the time. Um, probably what Maria needs more than anything is for something pretty bad but not catastrophic to happen to her. Maybe this breakup can be that thing, but probably not. It sounds like Maria is already spinning it into an opportunity for self-mythologizing instead of for learning or growth or whatever, which Maria will go on to talk about when she meets her own next girlfriend. Here's what I figured out about myself. Here's how emotionally honest I can be. Here's how vulnerable I am. Um, so we kind of think or hope perhaps that Maria is going to like find this more authentic self, that she's going to be able to get in touch with her emotions and be less repressed. Um, but from Steph's perspective, it sounds like this might be something Maria does a lot, right? Like it, like there might not be one perfect life-changing moment that we get in this book, um, which I think is sort of a commentary on like what 
life is really like, you know, like in fiction, people get these, these moments of epiphany, but in real life, it's often a lot messier and more complicated than that. Like we don't just change from a moment a lot of the time, we change from like a collection of moments, we change over time. Um, and sort of on that theme of authenticity, I want to turn your attention to page 124, um, where Maria is sort of obsessing about like being trans as she does throughout the book um, and feeling like very self-conscious about that. Um, she says, like, it would be nice to believe that you could just exist, just be some true, honest, essential self. But you only really get to have a true, honest, essential self if you're white, male, het, and able-bodied. So heterosexual um, and able-bodied. Otherwise, your body has all these connotations and you don't get the benefit of the doubt. Um, it's like the Buddhist thing where the Zen master goes, show me your true face. And the student goes, sure, here it is. And the Zen master goes, no, show me your true face. And the student goes, no, seriously, I am. This is my true face. And then the Zen master goes, get the fuck out of my house. You are not showing me your true face. And then the student goes, ah, I am showing you my true face. What true face are you even talking about? Nobody has a true face. And takes a swing at the Zen master. And the Zen master dodges it all easily and sits back and goes, ah, there it was. You probably don't have to leave my house after all. Um... There's probably more to it than that, but what Maria took from that story when she read it was frustrated, angry face is true face. Um, so Maria is very funny, um, but besides that, I think that she really makes some interesting points about like what it means to have a true self. Like, I think that that's something when we think about American literature and we think about kind of like the mythology of Americanness. Um, Americans are obsessed with individuality, right? Like we love thinking of like you know, like Walt Whitman's song of myself, like, I, I can think of nothing more um, obsessed with the idea of a true self than a poem literally titled Song of Myself that was first titled Walt Whitman, as we talked about in class. Um, and so she's kind of questioning this idea at all, right? Like, do we have a true self? Like, can we find that? Um, is the idea of a true self itself like a privilege right and I think there might be some truth to that just with the way in which um you know Maria came out as trans in order to live as her authentic self but she's constantly thinking about her identity um in a way that people with slightly more privileged identities or identities that are seen as normal when you're walking down the street, like, they don't really think about that all the time, right? Um, so I think, I think in that way, she's wondering, like, what, I don't know, like, what, what is a true self? And like, if we were, I mean, if we were in class, I would, I would ask you guys what you think, like, what, what is the true self? Like, do we have that? Or is that just like, sort of a, a dream made up by writers of fiction? Um, and I, I don't know, but I think it's, it's a question to consider. Um, okay, let's see. This is sort of out of order, sorry. Um, so I guess on the idea of a true self. Um, this book also talks a little bit about like how gender is a construct. So I just wanted to like address what that means for those of you who haven't heard of this before. So gender is a construct um, basically means that uh, gender is an idea that was invented by the members of society and that only exists because the members of society enforce that idea. Right? So like gender isn't somehow natural, it is rather constructed by people in a society. Um, and so that's, I mean, on a really like basic and kind of silly level, like, I don't know, in American society, men don't wear skirts. Like in, in Scottish society of a long time ago, men wore kilts. So like gender is um, constructed differently by different societies. Just different societies decide, you know, how we divide gender, um, how we draw those, like, lines. Um, like, some cultures have more than two genders that they see as, like, normal. 
Um, and society also decides like what you should and shouldn't do if you're a man or a woman, and that like that varies by culture. So on page 26, she's kind of talking about this. Um, and she's talking to Karen, and he's explaining stuff to her. And she says, oh my God, here's a person who knows the real smart truth about transitioning. Gender truly is a construct. And then she says, eventually you can't help but figure out that while gender is a construct, so is a traffic light. And if you ignore either of them, you get hit by cars, which also are constructs. Um, so I really like what she says here, right? Like, of course, like, you know, like gender, as I just said, like, it's not, it's not necessarily like innate right um like uh like my chromosomes aren't like why i wear earrings you know um but just like cars and just like traffic lights which people invented and like you know people invented the rules of traffic lights like that's a construct you know if we all stopped believing that red meant stop and green meant go like we could do that but things would change um <laughs> And so she's basically saying, like, in the same way, if you ignore gender entirely, um, that can be very dangerous because we live in a society where gender is pretty strictly policed. Um, young children are taught from, like, a very, I mean, children are, are taught from a very young age, like, what is and isn't appropriate for their genders. Um, and especially for her growing up in the 80s, you know, like, she would not have been encouraged to have, like, feminine interests at all as a child, probably. Um, yeah, so I think she's kind of, I don't know, she is thinking about the ways in which part of her true self is like a societal construct, but also is her true self, and it's complicated. I mean, I think that's what's really good about this book is that it is a really complicated book. Like, we, we have access to Maria's inner sort of monologue the whole time, and her thoughts are often like kind of contradictory like it's hard for her to make sense of things a lot of the time like there's no perfect truth about like the trans experience you know or like the feminine experience or any of these things um it's just sort of like one one woman's attempt to kind of explain what happened to her uh when she decided she needed to get out of new york and like steal her girlfriend's car and buy a bunch of heroin um and I also think it's interesting to look at, like, I think this will be my last point for the day, but just, like, the, the sort of symbols that she takes from other road novels. So, obviously, every road novel has in it a car. Um, this car is her girlfriend's car, and she stole it. So, she, and, and her girlfriend let her steal it. Like, she wasn't, you know, she wasn't mad about it. Um, Steph was like, well, whatever Maria needs to do this, she'll get the car back eventually. Um and the drugs so as I mentioned like fear and loathing is just like a drug bender it's a book about a, being on a like a bender um and so in this book she kind of talks a lot about how drugs are um when she was growing up and what she called Cowtown Pennsylvania like everybody just kind of did drugs because they had nothing better to do and for her she felt like she was just kind of like dissociating all the time anyway and like wanted to sort of escape however she could so she did drugs in that way but never was like you know a really like huge user of drugs and then she like buys all this heroin to go on this road trip not because she wants to do it but because it feels to her like something she should do like almost if she has all this heroin with her then she's like you know in, in like an edgy story about being on the road like at one point she even says you know like you know I figured I would write the great anti-American novel one day um and so in this story to me the drugs don't symbolize what they do in something like fear and loathing fear and loathing I think the drugs are like freedom and like you know um like the dark underbelly of like American culture and like excess and all this stuff I think in this book the drugs are a little bit more like escapism um sadness, uh, and I don't know, like, they never do it, like, they never do the heroin, the only person who does heroin in this book is Piranha, so I wonder, 
I don't know. Maybe I'll ask you guys that in the discussion thread. But I mean, if anybody, like, what, what you think the heroine symbolizes in this book as something that she never does. Maybe it's, maybe it's like her, her, uh, thwarted epiphany or something like that, you know, what she expected this road trip to do to her or do for her versus what it actually is capable of doing because, you know, like, wherever you go, you're still yourself, right? Like, you can't change your whole life by just, like, getting in a car and leaving it behind. Um, what else? Oh, and the last thing I want to mention was the sex in this book. Um, so this book begins in a sex scene and there's like a lot of very frank discussions of sex and masturbation in this book um and so i think on one level this kind of like harkens back to these older road novels by people like kerouac and hunter s thompson um which like have sex in them you know that was like a, that was like a thing in the 60s right like free love like you can write about sex um there's like less censorship you know writers were just writing more about sex um but in those in those stories sex was like again it was like excess it was indulgence it was freedom it was all these things in this book I think that sex is um it's it's linked more clearly to like the body right like I think that Imogen Binney is asking us to think like how do we see our own bodies right like how do we um how do we exist in sexual situations like and and why do we like the stuff we like and why do we feel uncomfortable in these situations etc um because obviously being trans is like first and foremost like comes from a place of like feeling like weird in your body um maybe not first and foremost but like that's that's a huge part of being trans right like is feeling weird in your body so Maria has a really hard time enjoying sex because she dissociates because she doesn't feel good about like what her body looks like um and the same thing for James right like James has a really hard time with sex because he doesn't like his body um and this kind of goes back to like Maria's idea of like you know who gets to have a true self right like whose body is in a position that everyone will just accept it as normal um so yeah so she so Vinny is kind of taking these like you know sex and drugs and like and even rock and roll right like everybody in this book is kind of like uh like grew up in these like kind of like punk rock cultures so she takes all these kind of like American anti-American like edgy badass themes and she recasts them I think in a way that's much more um it's much more thoughtful and it's not just like oh like drugs are fun sex is fun right it's more like why like what do these things mean um in the lives of these characters so um yeah okay I hope that was not confusing and also interesting um so for next time I'm going to I guess finish talking about Nevada I'm going to do like the second half of it and talk about like Maria and James and I guess other themes as well that I did not get to um so yeah if you have any questions let me know um I hope you guys are all doing well and I will talk to you soon bye